All right, so I'm like everybody. My name is Baba Ali. For those who are home watching this right now, inshallah, um, many people know me from my children's series, from my YouTube videos, um, and some people now know me from Half Our Dean. I've been doing this for since 2010, July, and we started our singles event, which is going to be happening next door, since 2011. So we've done about 84 events around the world, and I've about a few thousand people, alhamdulillah, have found that they're half using it, including myself. So I'm going to tell you a quick story about myself. I was looking to get married a long time ago. I struggled through finding my other half. My parents uh, are not religious whatsoever. Uh, most of my family isn't very religious whatsoever. So I was like, how can I find my other half? I can't go to my parents. I can't go to my community because they don't have any type of program. Uh, not much has changed, unfortunately. And you can't do... Uh, can go to my friends because most of my friends were like me they're single looking to get married so if they can't find a wife how am I going to help me find a wife and when I say much, not much has changed is because most communities are not like MCC MCC is a very very unique community because what they try to do is when they find something that actually works they will use it over and over and over again because they want their communities to thrive uh, since we came here we've, this is I think our ninth event in the last three years. And our highest, I've done about 84 events so far. Our highest success rate has been in that room with 84% of the attendees finding a match. We haven't had that same result anywhere else in the world. Uh, most of our events are about over 50%, but for whatever reason, it tends to be higher here in Pleasanton. All right. So I decided to do a singles workshop before, so this can be beneficial, beneficial for you no matter where you find your other half either from your friends, family, if it's going through events, even if you're going using the apps. I'm going to try to show you guys things that typically we don't talk about uh, with the hopes that we can take this stuff and use it. Um, I took me years to try to gather all this knowledge, and I want to show you things that you wouldn't typically hear in other places. So let's talk about the first uh, one is, these are the kind of people you see at single events, or you meet through friends and family, and you see people like this. Now, when you see someone with a name badge, all of us were wearing name badges at one point, um, what do you know about the person? If you just look at the person's picture, like if you, this is just, you walk, they walk in with a name badge, this, many of us will look us at, with a name badge, or you, if you meet them through friends or family, they're not wearing a name badge. What do you, when you see them, what do you think you know about them? So if you look at the brothers, you look at the sisters. So most people, they see each other, they're like, okay, let me find out if uh, some questions. Let me ask questions that are important to me. So just from our little audience here, about how many people, give me a typical question you guys may ask somebody when you're talking to someone for marriage. Are you religious? Are you religious? That's a very common question. Another question about Salah. Is Salah important for people? So what kind of question would you ask for Salah? Do you pray five times a day? Now, all the questions you guys are about to throw me, I have no idea. This is no type of conspiracy. I never asked any of you guys any of these questions beforehand. But because I've done this event so many times, I can predict the questions that are going to be coming in. Do you pray five times a day? As you can see on the screen, uh, are you religious? <laughs> it's on cue. I'm not typing any of this stuff. It's on cue. And the question we ask, the problem is that it's based on the honor system. You can ask someone, are you religious? And they can just say, yeah. You can ask them, hey, uh, do you pray five times a day? They'll say, yeah. Only after marriage you actually discover if any of the stuff they said throughout the whole courtship process was actually true or they've just been telling you what you want to hear. Sometimes people get a little more creative. They ask questions like, do you want joint accounts or separate bank accounts? They ask this or that type of question, right? But if there's a correct answer, people are going to answer the correct answer. No, one's, uh, no one asks like, like how, like, how would you figure out if they're a liar or not? Like, they've been lying to you the whole time. What would you ask? You're going to ask, are you a liar? They're going to say no. <laughs> if they're a liar, they're still going to say no. So that doesn't solve this. So I, I thought to myself, there's an art of asking questions. So the way I did it is I wasn't sure which website worked, just like many of us today. We don't know which of these apps work, which website works, which event works. So I joined all of them. And, but I was very, very specific on what I wanted in a spouse. And then what I did is uh, I, I put these profiles up, and because I joined so many websites, I got a bunch of responses, but now I have a problem. Even though it's a bunch of responses, 
I don't want to talk to a bunch of sisters. I know this sounds crazy, but I want to talk to one sister and just marry her. See so the way you're laughing at me? It's like, okay, that's not going to, what are you talking about, Baba Ali? That's not, that's not how the world works. I said, well, that's how I think I can make it work. So when 17 people contacted me, this goes away. This is not going, it's going away from my process. I need to talk to only one sister and marry her. That's my process. So the, the way I came up with it was I said, okay, I'm going to uh, come up with a system on top of the typical system that's out there. And that's what I'm going to show you guys today. The typical system out there is, you, now today in your generation, you're swiping, ta -ta 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 -ta, and you're just like, okay, let me pick this one, now this one, nope, yep, this, this is how you pick it. I mean, it's, it's even less than what we had. We have, back then at least we had some data from each person, like, even though it's very superficial, it's like your height, your weight, your eye color, your hair color, that's what they used to have back in 2001. Today it's just like, boom, 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 boom. So on top of this system, how can you filter this millions of people down to the person that matches for you? So what I did is I came up with a series of questions that didn't have right or wrong answers. I sent it to all 17 sisters. One of them answered it correctly. That's the one I married uh, 23 years ago. When my friend was looking to get married, he said, Ali, what are the questions you asked? Can I borrow those questions? I said, sure. I gave him my questions. He got married. He's my first success story, by the way. Who's married till today? And now every single person who asked him, how did you get married? He gives him the questions to help them get married. So now you're wondering, what about it? Can you share the questions? I'm even gonna do better than the questions. I'm gonna go through the psychology behind questions and how to develop even your own to make it work. Because the question that worked for me may not necessarily work for you. So what makes a good question? Now the, the main thing for a good question is that it has to be meaningful. It has to be something that you can't just say, okay, what's your favorite color? What do you watch on Netflix? That has nothing to do with me meaningful. It has to have some thought into it. It has to not, this is the main component. There shouldn't be a clear right answer. It has to be both answers look correct. So if you give two options, they both have to look correct. I'll give you an example. From a raise of hands, with all the stuff that's happening in the world today, do you think we need more justice or more mercy? From a raise of hands, how many people think we need more justice? Raise of hands. We need both, but, but who, how many people see a little bit more justice to try to fix things today? Can you raise your hands? Okay. About three people. How many people say mercy? About six people. Okay. Usually it's about 50-50, but that's fine. We need more mercy. mercy. Now, what is the correct answer? Of the nine, nine names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one is the most just, one is the most forgiving. And really what I ask you psychologically, are you more fair or are you more forgiving? And this is how, when, if I'm asking a sister for marriage, I may prefer, or a sister may prefer a husband who's more just, while her best friend, even though they're best friends, may want a husband who's more forgiving, more merciful. I don't know which each sister's preference is, so I can't give them what they want to hear. That's the psychology behind these questions. So, there can't be any type of yes or no questions because yes or no is a 50-50 chance of yes. So let's take a look at back at the initial questions that you guys, uh, what I gave you guys. Um, so the questions we were talking about is, do you pray five times a day? The way I would just change that question is you ask a question like, about what time does Fajr come in? If they have absolutely no idea, they're like, us oh, 7.30 a.m.? And it comes in like at 5, wherever you live. Then you know they're off. Like some, they may pray Fajr, but not regularly. They're not, you can't pray Fajr regularly and be off by two hours. <laughs> the sun's already up there for like an hour ago, and you're still praying. So that's how you ask it more uh, in a very unique way. Instead of asking, are you religious, say, okay, what type of role does Islam play in your life? Instead of asking, do you want joint accounts or saved accounts, that's what typical questions people ask. You ask questions like, what was money like when you were growing up? How is money handled for your family? Because a lot of people, they don't know what marriage life is going to be like or what I'm supposed to be doing. So they watch what their parents did. So if they like their parents, the way they, relate, they like to duplicate their success, they're going to copy them. If they saw a lot of drama in their family, they're going to do whatever their parents did in the exact opposite. So you want to figure out what was family life like and what was it like your parents, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And you say, well, how is money handled? Did it work? Did it not work? This is how you can get much more accurate answers. Like for example, another way to get an accurate answer from somebody, instead of just asking 
uh, about them, tell me about you, tell me about this. Ask about their friends. They don't want you to marry their friends. So they're not going to give you the right answers and try to make their friends look perfect and stuff like that. So they're going to tell you exactly their friends' good and bad parts about them. So you ask, okay, what is your favorite, don't, without backbiting, give me your favorite quality of your best friend or one of your close friends. And give me one of the qualities that you don't like very much. And then ask by multiple friends. And if you see a consistency of all of them, you know who you're talking to. Like if a sister is talking to a brother and every one of his friends, all of them drink, he drinks without even having to ask them. There has to be a connection why these people want to hang out with each other. If, there's, if there is no disconnection. So if all of her female friends all do X, Y, Z, all of them, then she's very, very likely to do X, Y, Z, whatever X, Y, Z is. And again, she's not going to try to make you marry her friends. She's going to be very clear about what her friends are because she wants the attention on her and vice versa for the males as well. So a couple of things when you're talking to people, this is stuff I noticed that people don't do. Um, people, when they, answer, when they ask questions and the person responds, they give away the correct answer. So you may ask a question about anything. And you do, oh, really? Oh, that's not good. Now imagine this is a job interview. And they ask you, so tell us about uh, some of your skills and this something, something. And then you answer it in such a way. And they start nodding their head and start writing stuff down. Mentally, you're taking a note. You're like, OK, for now on, for the rest of the interview, do not mention whatever I just said right now. They don't like that here. So I said, maybe I said a joke, or maybe I said something funny. They don't have a sense of humor. I will not try to be funny anymore in this job, job interview. So when you give away what you're looking for to them, now they will justify their answers to give you what you want to hear. So do not punish them for speaking the truth. Listen actively. Uh, don't make, pay, pay attention. And if you like something, or if something's unclear, give a follow-up question. Uh, the other things to pay attention to is be uh, patient when you're speaking to them. Uh, show genuine interest, like you're actually listening, hopefully. And, and practice giving uh, like active empathy. It makes it more of a human conversation. It doesn't feel like an interrogation. Some things to pay attention to, do not assume things. Just because someone says something, you may see a sister that doesn't wear a hijab and you assume she doesn't even pray and you'd be the farthest from the truth. Everyone has different struggles. Some of us brothers struggle through things that you don't see transparently. Like the women cannot see it transparently, but we struggle through certain things. Her struggle for that specific sister may have been hijab, and which is transparent because you can see in front of you. But you may be struggling with even something else that she can't see. So if you judge someone from the outside appearance and then make assumptions about it, it's just not, you may lose the opportunity to, uh, on a really, really good person. Uh, the other things to pay attention to is pay attention to uh, consistent behavior when you're speaking to them. Sisters, I'll give you guys a tip. One of the ways we men will test the boundary of what we're allowed, your halal, halal haram ratio is we will make a joke and we will wait for your response. If you respond negatively to that, we know that is your boundary. If you do not respond negatively, we'll keep pushing and pushing and pushing it forward until we get to our own boundaries. So sometimes women give it away by saying, I, I would never say that or something, or they show a very negative expression, which tells a guy, oh, oh, that's her boundary, so then that's where he stays. But then his true colors will come out after he marries you. So we hide this through jokes, and our get out jail free card is, I was joking, I was joking. Because if you respond negatively to the joke, then you have no sense of humor, and you're stuck up, and et cetera, et cetera. But if you respond positively to the joke, then you, that means you're OK. So that allows him to joke and test boundaries. Unfortunately, we live in a society today that, for both men and women, terms that are used today are very different than terms that are used when I was looking to get married. A common term that is now becoming more and more common is what is your halal to haram ratio? In other words, the people are asking each other that are looking married today, how much haram are you comfortable with? Which sounds crazy, but this is something that you have to just be 
be aware of because different people are now just becoming more and more comfortable with this, with these things, unfortunately. All right. So let's put it all together in a, in a practical scenario. I'm going to ask this question to somebody. Do you envision balancing career and family in the future? See, notice this is a very open question. How do you, sorry, how do you envision balancing career and family in the future? And if whatever they answer, you can follow up with saying, can you share an example of how you've seen this balance achieved? How are they just going to tell you what you want to hear? They can't just tell you what you want to hear. The question has to be thought out so you can really understand of how they actually think. All right. So those are questions. Gave you guys a scenario of how to do it. Now let's go to something even a little bit more, uh, more strategic, which you can do when you're speaking to someone for marriage. Instead of just asking them a question, give them a list of five things or five words and ask them to prioritize it from the most important to the least important. I'll give you guys an example. So the first example we have here is that, uh, actually let me make it a little bit bigger. Let's imagine you guys just in your head, look at these five words. From the female's perspective, this, I'll give the first five words are for the females and the next five words I'll be for the males. Right? So, sisters, if you look at this, the five words are financial stability, emotional connection, shared religious practices, physical attraction, and intellectual compatibility. If you had to sort that in order from the most important to the least important, what would your order be? Okay, think about that just for a moment. Then what you're going to do is, is, this is, from the male's perspective, it's the same idea. For men, they have different issues that they care about. So from a male's perspective, it would be family background, education and career, beauty, religious commitment, character and personality. If you ask the men to order it from the most important to least important, they will each have their own unique order. Because all five are good things to have, there's no right or wrong here. And that's how you get a more accurate answer than just asking yes or no questions. So let's do it in, in more practical terms. Let's talk about three things that are going to make an impact on marriage. And I put them actually on Half Ardeen's website. So every person on Half Ardeen does this. So one of the things we ask each person to do, and this is actually a screenshot from Half Ardeen, uh, we ask people to, we give them all five love languages, and we ask them to put them in the order from most important to least important. Then we give them the friendship qualities, and we ask them to put them from most important to least important. And then we give you shopping priorities put it most important to least important. So now you're wondering, okay, what's the big deal? Why is this so, okay, let's talk about a couple of different things. Love languages. How they express love or how they don't express love can cause friction between you. I'll give you an example. Let's say, and this is true for myself, let's say quality time is the love language of myself. For those, by the way, is there anyone that's not familiar with what the five love languages are? I just want, okay, I'll explain the five love languages. So before we jump into this, the five love languages is the f languages generally the, the, there's everyone is f falls for one of these five love languages. All right, there is physical touch, receiving gifts, acts of service, words of affirmation, and quality time. Physical touch are the people, and I'll go through each one in a little bit more detail in a moment, but physical touch in general is the people who show love through proper touching and stuff like that. That's obviously Islamically permissible between husband and wife. The second type of love that some people show is by receiving and giving gifts. Uh, the third is acts of service. Acts of service is by doing things. Like, for example, my wife, her uh, love language is acts of service. So if I go and help her do things without her asking me, like, for example, if I help her something around the house, I go put gas in her car and do all these small things for her, she shows, that's the way that she understands love. While somebody else may be married to a sister who may be words of affirmation. Your words are very important. Everything from like a small note you leave and says, I love you, to the text messages, they need that, that, that words of affirmation to feel loved. And if you don't share those, that way of love, they may not even feel loved. And last but not least is quality time. That's myself. Where spending time with somebody shows, me, shows her how much I love her. So if we don't spend time with each other, then I don't feel like there's love in the relationship. So if we, do, we need this amount of time. So each of us falls into one of those five categories. 
So which one is your love language? Now, some websites, and sometimes you go into a workshop, they just ask you for your love language. Oh, that's my love language. What's your language? Oh, that's my love language. Now, okay, now what do we do with this? <laughs> just, just because I know your love language, you know my love language, how does that help me get married? What's a good person for me? That's the real thing. It's like they do these personality tests with Myers and Briggs and all these other things. That's great information to help yourself and build yourself and work on yourself. But when it comes to getting married, how does any of that stuff help you? It doesn't, unless you understand the other layers of it that, okay, I understand what my uh, personality type is or what my love language is, but what is the best spouse to marry that love language would be most compatible with me? Which, so sometimes in your mind you're like, okay, if we have the same love language, that would be really, really great. And by the way, that is really great. But what if we don't? Can the marriage still work out? Well, again, I was, as I told you guys, I've been married for 23 years. Me and my wife, our love language are similar to each other, but it works out because we understand each other. And if you can understand that someone can show love in a different way, and if they don't show love the way you do, that, shows, that goes a long, long way without, without, uh, with, without um, causing misconfusion in the marriage. So the second group of words are friendship qualities. Now, why do I ask people to sort these words in order? Because the order of the way you choose friends says a lot about you. And every quality is a good quality. These are five qualities, and again, think about it in your mind. Which one would you choose uh, as number one, two, three, four, five? You have loyalty, reliable, sincere, understanding, and optimistic. Now, some people may choose Optimistic is number one. Some people would choose as number five. The question here is like, what if your number one is their number five? And just like love languages, if quality time is number one for me, but let's say it's number five for my wife, so she's like, oh, I love you, but I don't really want to spend time with you that much. <laughs> and I'm the opposite. I want to spend time with her all the time. We're going to have conflict. So if somebody wants consistent togetherness, and somebody wants their, like, I just want to be by myself, I, I mean, just send me a text message that's good enough type of me, it, it can cause uh, un unfortunate confusion between the two. And the last but not least is shopping priorities. One of the major things most couples fight about is money. And because they think about money sometimes often differently. So when it comes to buying something, I give you five options. Convenience, quality, style, price, or quantity. Which one's the most important for you? Which one's second most important? So again, you think to yourself, okay, how will this cause problems? Okay, let's say your spouse, price is number one for them. And let's say it's number five for you. So someone doesn't care how much something costs because someone cares about how convenient something is. I'm ordering DoorDash, again. Why, we, just, we already have food at home. I don't but I keep ordering it because it's just so convenient. I don't care how much it costs. And the other person's like, no, we need to save money and we got to do this and this. They can be two opposite extremes and they start clashing because of the way they view money differently. So now let's go through these things and show a little bit more in more detail. The five love languages. All right, so they can take these five, they sort them in the order. You have your order. So I want you guys, when you look at this, and if you, for those who are watching from home, take the five love languages, sort them in the order from the most important to least important. And then the person you're speaking to for marriage, ask them to do the same thing and then compare each other's lists. And when I went back to the previous list here on Half Ardeen's thing, you'll notice that, um, that the ones that have check marks on them, that shows that you both pick that in that item in that order. So in this example on the screen, we both chose quality time as number five, and the, and the convenience and style as number one and three for shopping priorities. You can see where you're aligned and where you're definitely not aligned. All right, you don't need more check boxes. doesn't necessarily mean that you're gonna be a perfect couple. It just shows you where you, you are aligned. Now, when you're not aligned, that's where you guys need to talk about things uh, so you guys are on the same page, inshallah. Okay, so let's talk about, uh, let's jump into some of the love languages to go into a little more detail, as I promised. All right, physical touch, it's, it's pretty obvious, but pretty much people who value physical closeness within the marriage, uh, they feel most love through commercial permissible forms of touch, um, they need that physical connection. Now, what if the person has that, that's if they have it as their number one, but what if that person has their, as, as their number five? 
maybe if they have it as their number five, it doesn't mean they're never going to be physical intimacy or physical touch. It just means that they prefer other forms of, of ways to express love. You know, some people are not touchy-feely people. You ever notice people, that you, some of them, everyone, they meet, they hug, 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 hug. They hug you, they grab you, they hold you, and you just met this person five seconds ago. And then some people, okay, hold it, okay, okay, stop, let come, let's just shake hands from far away type of thing. Uh, there are just different uh, ways of comfort, comfortability. And some people, their love language is physical touch, and some people it's not. Um, so they may focus more on verbal and other ways of showing expression of, of love. A lot of these love languages, not a lot, all the love languages, all five, are correlated to your childhood. So for physical touch, it may be someone who grew up with valuing appropriate type of physical connection. Maybe their parents had a lot of uh, hugs and kisses and we love you and that was the way they understood love. And because you grew up that way and your family was very much that way, you see love as your love language. Sometimes, very rarely, it could be the exact opposite. Because I didn't have all that and I, and I, and I craved it, now that became my love language. Um, the second love language would be words of affirmation. Words of affirmation is where if someone ranks as, as their top, these are the people who express love through words, uh, kind words through compliments, encouragement, support. Some people, unless you do that for them consistently, they don't feel loved. So if you're a spouse, this is their language, and you want to be the most amazing spouse in the world, Give those words to them. They'll mean the world to them. Even though to you it's like, oh, what's the big deal? Trust me. They have that. They feel loved. And when someone feels loved, they will take that love and they'll give it back, inshallah. Now, what if the person doesn't have that words of affirmation as their number one? What if it's their number five? Then they're more likely to show love through actions more than through words. And they may not need that frequent, consistent, I love you, honey bunny. I love you too, honey bunny. You know, all this stuff, they go through text messages. I sent 100 text messages today that may start to get under their skin if you do too much. Uh, so they may not need it as much as other people do. So what does that have to do with uh, how is this connected to someone's childhood? A person who has ver uh, words of affirmation, they're most likely going to be growing up. They were receiving lots of encouragement from their parents, uh, words of, of positive words, and they felt that they, they, they love that feeling. So this is why they have it also in their in, as they're growing up, inshallah. So I have a note here for myself. I, I took it just recently. I was just doing it on the plane right here. I'll just share it with you guys quickly for the, these five love languages, inshallah. So, um, for, so I'll, I'll just mention for the childhood really quick. So words of affirmation is households where, where praise, encouragement, and verbal expressions was about love. Acts of service, which we'll get into in a moment is parents show love through helpful actions rather than words of, or physical affection. Some families, you know, they may not be all huggy-duggy. They may not be kissing and hugging as, as much as, as, as affectionate as other families. It doesn't mean that the parents didn't love them. It's just they were different. So those parents throw, show actions. By actions, they show love. So those children, when they grew up, they learned that through actions is how I should give love. And that's the way I'm expecting to receive love because this is all they know. So as they're growing up and they have their own children, they do things for them to show love for them. So if you have a spouse like this way and they don't do love the other forms of expression as much, understand this is because they have a different love language. And again, you have to think to yourself, the more you understand it, how people are different with all these different love languages, the more it, you have less conflict when you're, you don't feel like you're getting love or you gave love and you, you, you're not getting the same response that you were hoping for. Uh, receiving gifts is another form of love. Uh, the ones who have it for receiving gifts, these are people who their primary form of affection was when they, when they received gifts. And sometimes uh, people who rarely received gifts, they value those gifts so much, this became their love language. So you'll notice that some people, they like to give gifts to people. Uh, they like receiving gifts. And it's not about the money, by the way. It's about the thought that counts. It could be very inexpensive gifts. It's the very fact that you put some time and effort to get them something, and they appreciate that. Um, as we're continuing, the last one here is quality time. So these people, like myself, 
if you really want to show love to them, you spend time with that person. And when you, show, when you spend time with that person, that person will feel loved. Uh, one thing that's interesting about sisters is that if, if for those, you know, when, when, brothers, when, when a brother gets married, he thinks, thinks through his lens. But from a female's lens is when a woman feels loved, because to them love is even more important feeling it than men are, a men respect, uh, appreciation feels more important. But when women feel loved, they'll take whatever love you gave them, they'll multiply it and give it back. They don't give a one-to-one -one ratio. They multiply it. So it, that's how important it is for women. Men don't do that. Men don't multiply it and give back. Men do other things. They try to show more through actions. So men, like my daughter when she was growing up, Every time I would say, I love you to her, she would respond back, I appreciate you, Baba. Even at five years old, four years old. She doesn't say, I love you. The reason is not because she doesn't love me. It's because she understands my, lang langu my language as a, as a father, as a husband, is feeling appreciated. And I know if I make Baba feel appreciated, he'll feel loved. There are so many like, men today that don't feel appreciated no matter how much they're doing, how hard they're working. And that's where they don't feel that same love. So the husband doesn't feel appreciated, the wife doesn't feel loved, and then suddenly they both are talking to the imam about divorce. And I think all this can be avoided if we kind of understand a little bit more about why and how we each think differently. Aside from just the gender differences, the, the personality differences, the love language differences, there's so many layers to a human being that makes them who they are. And then there's other things that are like, culturally how you grew up, your family how you were raised, you have your own personal temperaments, all of those things and your own experiences, they all combine to make you, you. I don't think oftentimes we give people a chance. We do something and we are expecting a certain result and we don't get it. We get frustrated and we're okay, I don't feel loved, I don't feel appreciated, I'm done type of thing. But we don't take the time to understand how the opposite person that we're interacting with, how maybe they don't have ill intentions. Maybe this is the way they show love in a different way. So maybe I'm just, like let's say my words of affirmation is my biggest thing, right? And I'm not getting the words that I'm expecting. I send the text messages, I, I wrote this letter, I wrote a poem or whatever, and I'm not getting the same thing back. So I don't feel loved. And, but, but then for a moment, if I just sat down and thought about it, all the other things this person is doing is showing me that they love me, but I don't really think about it because my love language isn't that. So maybe, for example, acts of service. They're doing all these small things for me that I just take for granted. So I may not feel love because it's not my love language, but I know they love me because of the language they're giving out, inshallah. So that's the love languages. Um, so the other element of this is I gave you guys the list is friendship qualities. Now, why are these things important? What does reliable mean? What does understanding mean? I just need to check my time, inshallah. Okay, we're good still. So what does uh, reliable mean? What does understanding, loyal, sincere? What does it actually mean if, if a person chooses that as their number one? What if it means if they choose as a number two, number three? So if I choose a spouse and they have this as their number one, does that mean it's bad? So if they didn't put loyal as number one and loyal is number one for me, does it mean it's not going to work out? No. It just means they think differently than you. Um, so the order that people put words in tells you a lot about how they think. And that's all we're trying to do. We're trying to figure out how they think. Now next week what I'll be doing is I'll be going through personalities because as I said there's multiple layers. If you understand your personality, which I'll go over inshallah in detail, and you understand what you're attracted to, those are two great things. But there's something more important than both of those things. Understand what you can tolerate. Everyone who gets married, marries someone they're attracted to. The ones who get divorced are the ones who marry, marry someone they can't tolerate. So I follow the opinion that it is far more important to be able to tolerate someone than just being attracted to them. If you want to get married, just marry someone that you're attracted to. If you want to stay married, marry someone you can tolerate. So how do I figure that part out? Well, you have to understand the personality types and which is the weakness that comes with each one. So for example, if someone is reliable as number one, fantastic. What if it's number five? 
um, uh oh. Okay, something has to be number five for every list. Can I deal with number five? So, for example, we go back to our love languages we just did a minute ago. Quality time is number five for that sister or brother, or I'll say spouse. How is that going to make your marriage? Are you okay with that, that you're not spending consistent toge togetherness? Some of you will say yes, some of you will say, uh, that's not going to work for me, because this is very, very important. And some of you are like in the middle, oh, if it happens, it happens, if it doesn't, it doesn't, I'm okay with that. So it's not a deal breaker for you. So what I, my point is when I'm doing these presentations in this workshop, is I'm not just looking at what your number one is, I think your number five is just as important as your number one. Because you have to figure out, can I tolerate a spouse that these are their number fives for all these lists? All right. So let's talk about reliable. So someone chooses number one for reliable, what does that mean? That means they are, uh, they value consistency and dependability in a partner. They, they follow up, if you want something done, having someone as reliable as their number one, these are very reliable people. And a lot of spouses, they prefer a, someone who's very reliable. Uh, they seek someone who they can count on in all situations. So now what if their number five is reliable? Now what kind of spouse am I gonna be expecting? What should I say? So maybe they might focus more on emotional or spiritual qualities. Uh, or they can prioritize like being more spontaneous rather than consistent. That may be something interesting for your marriage, inshallah. Or they may value other things, maybe creativity or, or passion more highly. So every element of these has an Islamic perspective too. Islamically, if someone chooses reliable, if you have choosing a reliable husband or wife, the reliability aligns with the Islamic concept of amana, right? Amana is someone that you give something to or you trust something with, and if this person is reliable, you're good. You don't have to worry twice about it. The Prophet was known for al as sadiq the truthful, and Al-Amin, al the trustworthy. And the Quran for, uh, emphasizes fulfilling promises and obligations. So reliable is extremely important in Islam. So this is a great quality to have. And all these, by the way, I'll show you that they're, they're important to have. Understanding. So if their understanding is their number one, they value empathy. How many sisters ask for emotional intelligence? How many sisters ask for a husband who has not just sympathy, but empathy? Sisters will put this very, very high on their list. So a husband whose understanding is very important, just as much as important as reliable as you can argue. Uh, people who are uh, understanding, they prioritize listening over talking and emotional support. They seek a partner who tries to see things from different perspective, from their perspective as well, not just their own perspective. So what if they put understanding as number five? Now everyone's panicking. You see all these good things, but what if it's number five? Well, maybe they might focus more on practical support and shared activities. Maybe they prioritize through other qualities like decisiveness and ambition. We should be the opposite. Right? So it's like, oh, okay. Those are sisters like, okay, I like a husband who's ambitious and decisive. Uh, maybe they value actions over emotional comprehension. So they're more of an action-oriented person. And many men are, by the way. Many men are by action is where we show our love. So Islamically, what does this mean if they have understanding? Well, Islam encourages understanding and kindness between spouses. Uh, the Prophet Islam, who had a good understanding of his family life. And the Quran advises living with spouses in kindness and tranquility. So again, very good qualities. Again, let's go, to, let's go to loyalty. If they chose loyalty as number one, their commitment, they are loyal. I mean, who doesn't want a loyal spouse? I mean, every man will say the loyalty was probably one of the important things for many, many men. But some, they, they prioritize faithfulness and dedication. It seeks a partner who stands by them through challenges. If we go up or down, no matter what the situation is, if someone's loyal, you have them. They have you. And that means a lot. But what if it's number five? That means I can't trust them? What does number five mean? What if it's number five? Well, they may prioritize other qualities over loyalty. Maybe they focus more on practical or emotional aspects. They may take loyalty for granted in a committed relationship. So hopefully, number five, it's not number five for loyalty for anybody, but if it is, that's what it means. So Islamically, what does it mean? Islamically, the, it's highly emphasized loyalty in Islam. The Prophet Islam, Exemplified loyalty in his relationships, and the Quran encouraged fulfilling co uh, contracts. When you make an agreement with someone, you have to follow it. 
if two Muslims come together and they sign the thing, that is a sign of a, we have to be loyal to this contract. We have to be loyal to my word, loyal to my promises. That's a sign of loyalty. All right. Sincere. Now, that's the next one. The same as our last one. Let, sincere and optimistic. Okay, so those who are sincere, what does it mean if they have it for number one? They value honesty and being authentic in their relationships. They prioritize being genuine emotions and intentions. And they seek a partner who is true to their word and feelings. Now, if it's number five, they may prioritize other actions over, wor over words or intentions. Uh, they could focus more on practical aspects of the relationship, or they may value other traits like humor or intelligence more highly. Islamically, sincerity important? Surah that we all know, Surah Ikhlas, uh, is a fundamental principle in Islam. It's literally called Ikhlas, sincerity. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam emphasized the importance of sincerity in, in all actions. Our intention, uh, Quran encourages believers to be truthful and sincere in their dealings. And by the way, all of these elements, which we don't have time to go through everything right now, has implications on marriage as well. Like, what would marriage life be like if I have someone who is sincere? What would marriage life be like if I have someone who is loyal? What would marriage life be like if someone this? And of course, if someone chooses their number one and puts something as their number five, it doesn't mean that they're not optimistic or not loyal or not whatever. It just means this is how they prioritize things, right? So their number five does not mean they don't do this. It just shows you what's most important, what's least important. So last but not least is to optimistic. If someone's optimistic, they value positive, they have a they value positive outlook and hopefulness. They prioritize finding solutions and seeing the bright side of things. They seek a partner who encourages and uplifts. So that's, that's a big plus. Sorry, I forgot to change the screen here. So in the previous screen, we had this, and I, I, I don't know if I, I'll leave it there for a few seconds for the people who are home watching. Uh, this is what we're talking about, optimistic, uh, sincere, and, this is, and now we're talking about optimistic, it's just this. So from optimistic, the, if it's least important, they might prioritize being realistic, more practical. Uh, so it's like, okay, I, I'm trying to be positive, but I'm, let's be realistic here. I don't think what you're saying works. I want to do some solutions to actually prior, do work. They value critical thinking over optimism, or they can focus more on problem solving than positive thinking. Now, Islamically, Islam encourages hope and trust in Allah subhanahu taala's plan. The Prophet saw Islam taught us to be optimistic and avoid despair. Remember, despair is who? Shaitan. He had, at least had despair, gave up and became Shaitan. And the Quran emphasizes the importance of patience and positive expectation. So there is no, there is no right or wrong in the list I gave you guys, the five things that prioritize friendship qualities. All of these are correct, and it goes back to the, the, what we've been talking about today. If you're speaking to someone from marriage, you need to give them something that everything looks correct. And when everything looks correct, this is what you're going to hear when you know this is right, by the way, when you know your question is good. This is hard. And what they're really saying is, I don't know what the right answer is. And the focus shouldn't be whatever the right answer is, because they don't want to look in a negative angle. They want to say, I, want to, I, I like you, I want to learn more about you, and I don't want to say the wrong thing to lose this opportunity. And that goes back to what I was saying earlier. You have to show them that, look, I'm here to, with open mind and listen. I'm not going to jump to conclusions. I'm not going to make assumptions about you just because you say X, Y, Z here and so A, B, C here. I'm here to listen through all of it. And when you listen to everything, the love languages, the, we haven't gone to shopping priorities, but shopping priorities, all these different things, when you listen to everything, then you come up with your conclusion, is this a person for me to proceed for marriage? The way we're doing it right now, when we're speaking to somebody, we ask very basic questions. Are you good Muslim? Do you eat halal meat? Do you read Quran? It's just very basic and person, yes, yes. Yeah, and just say yes to everything you want to hear. And you're, okay, mashallah, this is the perfect person. No, you found someone that tells you what you want to hear, and then years later or months later after you get married, you find out it's a completely different person that you married. Ask any divorcee. They'll say, if I knew he or she was like this, I would have never married this person. Well, what didn't you see? Believe it or not, those people didn't hide all the red flags. They give small ones, but most people don't pay attention to them. They give them passes and passes. And they, oh, okay, I wasn't paying. After the divorce happens and the reflecting, they're like, wow, when he or she said that, I should have paid more attention. And when they were doing this and this and this, I, I didn't really take it too serious. 
So people give you the red flags, it's just we just you know, pay attention to them because we're so fascinated. Uh, and sometimes we're just even the concept of just getting married and trying to make everyone, our, marry, our parents happy or whatever the situation is. What I'm trying to do is I'm not trying to help you just get married. I want you to stay married. And that's why like, when I try to design a workshop, I'm like, what can I give them that they haven't normally heard? And love languages isn't something new, uh, but when they just give you your love language, you find out what it is for yourself, that's great. But what can I do with this knowledge and apply it and use it to help myself get married? So I don't have enough time to go through everything, but shopping priorities is basically the same thing as well. Um, and you're just basically gonna go through all five things. You give them a list of five words and you ask them to prioritize from the most important to least important. Again, you are trying to see is your number one their number five? That's the main concern. And what's, if they're five and one, yes, you have a question? Oh, sorry, slide. <laughs> I'll try to do all things at the same time. Sorry about that. Yeah, is there number one, then number five? Is there five, number one? Uh, that's the main thing. If you're both number ones match, fantastic. You guys are on the same page. You'll have less arguments about this topic. Now, what people are looking for, they're looking for the perfect husband, the perfect wife. They're looking for the unicorn. There's no such thing as a unicorn. There's something gray and chubby. They call them rhinos. That's the closest you get to it. There is no unicorn in the world. There is no perfect husband. There's no perfect wife. You have to find someone, it sounds crazy, find someone who's decent that you can tolerate. Find that, and I think you'll be far more happier than a lot of people are right now. Because being single is not necessarily being happy. It's sometimes very lonely. It's very tough. And I know what it feels like because I struggled through it myself. I went through it. A lot of times I see people like organizing single events. I'm like, do you even struggle through this process? No. I married my cousin. I'm, you don't know anything about what we're going through right now. Like, the way you guys are doing it and the, le the least amount of thought that you put into the entire program shows me you have no idea what we're struggling through. And the people who interact with me and say, hey, I've been to your event, I can tell how much each and every activity you have thought through and why we're doing this type of thing. I can see there's a reason why we're doing every activity. Like, for example, one of the first activities we do is an activity called Similarly Different, where instead of me telling you don't judge your book by its cover, I try to find, show you that each person in this room is unique, if you give them a chance. And I, I show you, without uh, a mom giving a speech, without me giving you a talk, no. I will physically show you through an activity that every single person in this room is unique. And I think once you kind of like break these barriers, and the reason I do that, by the way, is because a lot of us make assumptions about people that are not true. We see people from their outside appearance, and I see people by their ethnicity, by your age, by your different, maybe your appearance, and I make assumptions about you that are almost probably the exact opposite of what reality is. And I feel that this is from a guy who's done, or half our about 84 events so far, Thousands of people have come through them. Thousands of people have come to the website. I have interacted literally with thousands of people. And I will tell you that there's a lot of good people that don't get a chance. They have become invisible. Because everyone doesn't see what's under their, right under their nose. And I think if people just give each other a chance, they will be surprised that, wow, my other half was here the whole time, but I didn't even look this way. And the the question is, how do people become invisible? Well, I don't want to sound like a conspiracy theorist person, but I think sometimes the people you're trusting to help you are not necessarily helping you. When you go to these apps and they ask you, have you been divorced? They don't, they're not just concerned, oh, you divorced, tell us about your story, no. The only reason they're asking that if you're divorced or not is to filter you out. The reason we ask you these certain questions is to filter you out. They're not filtering you out. It's so that everyone else filters you out. So when you click on the divorce and you say yes, no, whatever, it is just, they, they're treating it like it's just black and white. It is almost like me asking you the question, have you ever been in an accident before? And you're like, yes. Oh, she or he must be a bad driver. I did not ask the question, were you sitting at the red light when the car hit you? Because you were in an accident. 
is very different than you being the person who's just driving and hitting a bunch of cars. Those are two different drivers. I was sitting in the car, <laughs> turning on my car, the parked car, and some car hit me because they're driving crazy. Both of us technically are in an accident, but we're two different drivers. But if we're on a website, or you've been in an accident before we both put yes, and other people are searching on this website, do you want to find people who drive crazy? Would you like to marry a spouse who drives crazy? No, thank you. Then I become invisible. That's what they do. The other thing that become, makes you invisible have they made is your age. They have made you invisible by your age. You go to events and say, okay, I'm, so I'm, like, I'm looking to get married. Okay, uh, how old are you? I'm this age. Oh, I'm sorry, our maximum limit is this. Oh, what does that mean? That means no marriage for you. That's what it means. Who, wait, who decided that no marriage for me? Who came up with the age of 36 is the maximum? Is it, is it Islamically? Is there a sunnah? Is there a, a, what, where are you coming up with this? Oh, nobody. Okay, we just decided. We, the organizers, who I married my cousin, I decided that you is a maximum age. I'm like, to me, that makes no sense. And I'm a guy who organizes events. And I, I say this publicly to people. I challenge this. And I say, look, I follow the opinion that this is my idea, is that ask the attendees what the maximum age is. If the room, all these people who are coming or applying for this event, and say, hey, our maximum age is this age, 44, then the maximum age is 44. If you do another event, and the maximum age is 37, then it's 37. If it's 50, it's 50. Let the attendees choose, not you. You're not marrying these people. They're marrying each other. They will let them choose what the age is. This is the problem that we have. It's like, like the websites are choosing, okay, let's just ask each person if they're divorced or not, and then put it in the search. Do you want to search, do you want people divorced or not? Of course they're going to choose no. I think we should remove the question. I think we should let people learn about each other through these type of things. Your character, your personality, your, what makes you you. I don't think your divorce status defines you. I don't think your age defines you. In fact, brothers, I'll challenge us, if we, and sisters too, but I'll just say brothers as an example because there's more brothers in here than sisters. When have you ever seen a singles event or a marriage talk with more brothers and sisters? Impossible, but alhamdulillah. So you take five sisters here and you have ages 31, 32, 33, 34, 35. I bet you none of us brothers can get them in order unless we're purely guessing. I don't know, what does a 32-year-old sister look like and what does a 31-year-old sister look like? I have no idea. One was born in January, one was born in December. They're, they're one month apart. <laughs> I don't even know. Like, to me, it's just the most craziest thing. When I tell people I'm, I'm what's the date today? Today is September 14th. October 11th, I will be 50 years old. So you don't look 50. Exactly. What does these things look like? Your energy, the way you conduct yourself, the way you carry yourself. Some people are younger, they act old. Some people are older, they act young. You've seen it. Even like sometimes you see grandparents, someone's active, and so uh, you know, the younger guys look older, and the young, uh, younger people, older people look younger. How they take care of themselves, what they eat. Sometimes they're healthy, sometimes they're not. Sometimes they're energetic, sometimes not. Some of the people are just negative. These negative people, they're way older than they seem. How you are. So what's this number they put next to your name, on your name badge? I can't believe that some events will actually put your age on your name badge. Are you serious? Why don't you put the letter D for divorce and H for this and just cross, just, here, just take the name badge, just cross me off. <laughs> I have no chance. I'm literally invisible at this thing. Anyways, sorry. I'm just venting here because I'm frustrated and I just see this, I see so many good people, brothers and sisters, so many men and women that are really good, but are the way it's been designed they don't give it a chance and I think they deserve a chance so um, I, I want to show the reason why I did this workshop and why I want to do other workshops is every workshop will inshallah be different but idea is that show people what there's other things to look at as well uh, I started something interesting that, um, that you don't see uh, very often and to the best of my knowledge, this is the only one in the world that I know that is happening. I decided to start my first WhatsApp group. And I said, I'm doing a WhatsApp group that I don't think anyone will even try to do this. I'm doing a brothers only WhatsApp group who want to learn all this stuff and there's nothing to be sold. I'm not selling classes. I'm not a coach. I don't have any uh, courses to sell, nothing. I'm just saying every day I make one post 
and I, and I share these type of things in detail for anybody who wants to learn it and use it and get married. And there's no catch to it. There's nothing to be sold. There's no payment, nothing. And I say, it's like 100 brothers on the group. And I just started maybe last week. So a lot of sisters are like, where are these brothers? Where are the serious brothers looking to get married? This is as oftentimes, there's other brothers may be like jokes, but the serious brothers like yourself who take the time to come and spend time to learn, these are the serious brothers. These are showing that when all brothers are not the same. There are people who are trying to do things differently. I put it here and I just did this on, on the flight when I landed in the Uber here. I just put it, so if anyone's interested in this WhatsApp group, there's no catch to it. I just put the, the thing here, and obviously it shows that I don't know how to use the, the thing. All right, so I will put the QR code up on the screen uh, for those who are interested and want to learn about uh, that. If, so if you know brothers that want to uh, learn about all these different things that I've learned through, it took me years to learn, I'm more than happy to share these things with them because I want you guys to be successful. And I think this is here because it's been downloaded. Or maybe I just share it with the link with MCC and then they'll, they'll share it with you guys, inshallah, because I don't think it's been updated here. Um, I updated the presentation to have it. So um, uh, I want you guys, inshallah, to find your other half. I will open up the thing for any type of questions because we have a singles event I have to host <laughs> in a few minutes. Does anyone have any questions before we move on? Yes. Yeah, so alhamdulillah, very, very good point. So we have the four things we choose, and deen's the best. So for those who are not familiar with the hadith, it's like the four things you choose, as the brother just mentioned. Uh, the, and I, I'm just only repeating it because you don't have the microphone. The people may help me out, heard you. Um, he's asking the question of how does this correlate with the Prophet Sallam, the hadith of the Prophet I uh, will paraphrase it here. We're going to choosing someone on four different things you can choose from, the, the best being the deen. So you have physical attraction, you have family, you have uh, wealth, and you have, I don't think brothers too, these days choose a sister on wealth, but I think maybe a while back, maybe today, maybe different, sisters are more successful than brothers sometimes, they're more educated today, but nevertheless, uh, wealth and Dean, and Dean is number one uh, best thing to choose from. Um, when I do my personality, I show people, for example, this is the personality you're born with. This is the characteristics you have by default. How you, the other characteristics that you're missing, that you adapt, are going to be, make you even a better person. So let's take an example of Omar and Abu Bakr, for example. Omar and Abu Bakr were the ten, of the 10 people told that they will go to Jannah while they're alive, they were two. But if you look at these two people that are very much, uh, they're documented in history, so many, the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu you'll see the stories of Omar, stories of Abu Bakr. But these two personalities, very, very crystal clear, no difference of opinion, very, very different personalities. Uh, Omar is tough, Abu Bakr is not too tough, he's very kind and soft. So they're opposite, you can say almost opposite personalities. And they both ruled at one point, Abu Bakr for two years, Omar for ten years. How they were is very interesting because where you are, let's say I will, some men and some women, they're more tougher. Some men and women are more softer. How you're born by default is one thing, but what you do with that afterwards is, is who makes you you and that's where you become the best of your character. So when we see Islam, as you're saying, the deen, when we think of deen, when I ask people about deen, the most a common thing I com constantly hear is, oh, this person is very religious. And I married them, and the whole thing was a disaster, blah, blah, blah. Okay, what made them very religious? Oh, they prayed and they fasted. Okay, so that's Dean for a lot of people. That's like saying they're a great mathematician. But what do they know? They know addition, they know subtraction, they know multiplication, they know division. I'm like, that's not a great mathematician. That's just, <laughs> that's basic arithmetic. That's not, like, complicated. Do they know even calculus? No, 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 no. They, yeah. So I'm saying, when we're saying this person is very pious, Dean, the, the level that we have put for Dean is so basic, I think it should just be common. When we look at piety, we have to look at a person's character and how you carry yourself. One of the ways I see a person, what, like, what kind of belief they really have in Islam, is how they treat the most insignificant person in their life. The person you have absolutely nothing to gain from them. 
Because many people, when they need to get something from someone, they need a position, they need money, they need whatever, they're very kind, they're respectful. But when you have nothing to this person that has a person who maybe cleans the garbage on the side of the street, how do you treat this person? How do you treat the waiter when this person is serving you? Now I can see a reflection of your character. I see a lot of reflection of people's characters when you do business with them. I've done, uh, uh, many of us have done business with, unfortunately, with some negative Muslim experiences that people are like, I don't want to ever do business with Muslim again. How do we go from the greatest ummah in the world to we each other don't want to do business with each other? It's because that same guy who you don't want to do, ever do business again, he probably fasts a month of Ramadan. He may, may likely come to the Masjid and pray. There is a disconnection between those basic things and then doing the real additional things that make you pious. So when it comes to the deen aspect of it, to answer your question, is I, you have to have the other characteristics that make you that you don't have weren't born with. So going back to Abu Bakr and Omar, Abu Bakr is very soft and kind and gentle, etc. Omar is tough. Abu Bakr, first test he gets when he's uh, the khalif is what? The people are not going to pay the zakat. There's a group of people that always pay zakat. They will not pay zakat since the Prophet has passed away. So what does he do? I'm going to go to war with them. Abu Bakr, you're going to war? It's like, that doesn't sound like Abu Bakr. The man who's taking care of orphans more than anyone else, taking care of the widows. He's going to war? This sounds like what, something like Omar would say. Who's the first person to go to Abu Bakr and say, oh, uh, Abu Bakr, maybe we shouldn't go to war. The Prophet had just passed away. Uh, maybe we should just give him a pass. And Abu Bakr's response to that was, no. If they paid during the time of the Prophet, وسلم, they will pay now. That's a man who's born gentle and kind, but Islam makes him tough when he needs to be tough. Omar, opposite. Tough, and now he knows when to be soft and kind because by default he has that toughness born into him and softens it. That's the deen element. So how do they learn these characteristics? They learn from the Prophet Wasallam on how to be the best of character. And we know there's nothing on your scale that weighs higher, more weight than good character. So going back to your question, sorry for the long answer, is the deen comes with all of these things and learning all these things to make ourselves better Muslims, better husbands, better wives, and understanding our husbands and our wife is so important for us to be good spouses, inshallah. That's the reason. Yes? Good information. What is the effect of the parents on the marriage? Very much. So one of the issues that we especially for Muslims and some of the cultures, some of the parents could be very good and some can be very bad. And the challenge is like our parents love us. So when we come and tell my mom or my dad, I said, dad, mom, this is what my wife did today. And we're fighting today. My wife, my mother and father, they listen to this. Oh, I don't like when someone treats my son like this. I don't like when someone treats my daughter like this. They hear these negative things. So they have this negative feeling. And then a week later, no, two days later, Oh, we're friends again. I can't believe I was mad. What were you arguing about? Oh, I, don't even, I can't remember what, I fought, what we were fighting about. You became friends. You're lovey-dovey back to normal again. But mom and dad, they still have that little bit of memory. And they remember the second time, the third time. Every single time something happens, the parents are hearing this. Your, her best friend or his best friend is hearing this. And they're giving this bad advice to say, hey, maybe you deserve better. Maybe you should get divorced. Maybe you married the wrong person. And that's where I think the parents sometimes get involved too much and should let the couple try to figure it out on their own. Now, when it gets to a situation where there's divorce about to occur, when the, we, then we follow the sunnah of what we're supposed to do, where you separate the beds, et cetera, et cetera. But one of the parts that many people don't follow today is that you bring one representative from each side to try to make peace between both sides. But if these two representatives are both biased, because they've heard all the negative things, how are they going to make peace? They're going to start fighting. <laughs> so I think when we have husband and wife disputes, every minor thing does not need to be told to our friends and not to be told to our parents, not to be told to the community, not social media. So I'm like, everybody, how are you guys doing? Let me tell you what's going on. I'll tell you with my husband and my wife. No. So keep it between the husband and wife. Resolve it. It is almost like you have bad weather outside. And when you have bad weather, it doesn't feel like it's going to end. You have to be patient and realize that no matter how bad the weather is, no matter how much it's raining, no matter how hot or how cold it is, it's temporary. So whatever dispute I'm going with through my wife, 
it is normal. And we just have to figure it out, learn to figure it out. And a lot of it's figuring out is understanding each other. And that's why I did the workshop today. Understand why my spouse is saying this, why my spouse is communicating this way. They're just different. So understanding what we talked about today is one thing, but there's another layer is the personalities, which I'll be doing next week. Understanding what their personality is. How is their personality different than your personality? Why does that make a difference? And which personality works best for me? That's the number one question. Which personality can I tolerate the most? Do I want a spouse who's always like this or always like this? Oh my, I can't stand this. Oh, every one of the spouses I mentioned, the negatives, are all negative. <laughs> There's nothing positive. But I will show you the worst possible situation and then you decide to yourself, can you tolerate that? Actually, there's an activity that we do where I give you 60 negative words and I tell you choose seven that you can tolerate. Based on the seven that you choose, I can tell you which personality type you are most likely to tolerate. And based on that, it's okay, I need to find a spouse or a, hus a husband or wife that has this personality because if I find this, I can tolerate it. Even though negatives, I can tolerate So you have to find someone who tolerates you, someone you can tolerate them, inshallah. All right, any other questions before we start? the next program all right all right thank you everyone for coming sorry if i went over my time and yes question oh, go ahead. <laughs> so i was trying to put a qr code up uh for for those who are interested for, i was just quickly mentioning that i started this just last week i just know there's a lot of people who are on who are on uh whatsapp groups and and i try to join a couple of them to see what the whatsapp groups are like um I'll leave on the screen for later, but um, I, and every WhatsApp group I've noticed is guys and girls just post profiles. What's your name, your age, your height, your education level, blah, blah, blah. And they just, it just post, 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 and there's hundreds of people, and if you join today, you didn't see any of the posts from last week. It's just chaotic, and I thought to myself, is there any other things that people, I don't think WhatsApp was designed for this, but maybe we can use WhatsApp for something different. So I made a WhatsApp group called Marriage Minded Brothers, because I, I thought to myself, I've never seen a men's only group that talk about the subjects we talk about. And they just give men the information so they don't have to go search on their own and go into detail. And they're not selling you anything because every time you join a group, okay, here's my class, here's this, I'm a coach, I'm this, I have none of those things. I have nothing to sell you. The most I will even tell you is if anyone's interested, there's a singles event happening. If you guys want to meet other people who are thinking like you, that's it. There's nothing else I'm trying to sell. And I even, even a half writing website. I'm just there to just provide free information for you, those who are interested so you guys can learn and use it. That's it. And the only thing it says in the description, if you benefit from it and you find your spouse, the only thing I ask you to do is make dua for me on the day of judgment. That's it. That's my deal with you guys. There's nothing else. There's no catch to it. But yeah. So anyways, I have to go to the next program. Uh, but uh, Jazakallah khair for everyone for coming for today.